a concept for you as well. We're going to talk about scenography. As uh, Oliver was saying yesterday, uh, scenography is all of these things. I've, I've put some, added some things to the list. So it's basically everything that you see at the LARP, except the other players who are the players. But everything else uh, can be sort of lumped into the overall category of scenography. It's things like the, the physical place where you are, the location, the set. Oliver's talking, talking about backdrop, but things like the walls and maybe the furniture or maybe you have because of course it can also be like a theater stage you can have a painted backdrop for instance the props that's the physical items that are used in the game the costumes uh, on the players if they are uh, in the fiction and indeed even if they're not of course you can see them but also things like lights and music uh, and food the food if the food is present in the game uh, whether it's in the fiction or of the fiction it affects of course something that things that you see and i also put weather on the list because maybe there is rain in your larp and sometimes the rain comes from the sky of the universe you know where and it rains on you whether you have planned for it or not and sometimes it's very important in your in your game that there is rain at a specific time and then you may think have to think about how to solve that um, this fader goes from 360 degree illusion, I'll explain it, to symbolism, I'll explain it. Um, and actually this fader combines a number of different things that can be happening with the sort of physical environment or, or visual environment uh, of the LARP. But basically what it measures is how much do I as a player have to translate the sensory input, what I see and, and hear and feel in the room so that it fits. Uh, the fiction. So for in symbolism, for instance, if we say that we're playing a LARP at the train station in Berlin, uh, or that is set at the train station in Berlin, and we're all the passengers and the security guards and so on, and we're playing it in this room, we're going to have to translate quite a lot to say, so, okay, the trains, maybe the cars are the trains and so on. And one of the challenges is that unless we have a big briefing before what are the trains and where's what in this room, we're, we might translate it very differently. But for some other LARPs, it doesn't really matter so much. Uh, on the other hand, we may want to play the same train station game in the most realistic possible way. And then perhaps we go to that actual train station in Berlin and LARP it there. And then everything in the environment represents exactly the same thing. It looks exactly the same uh, as it is in the fiction. What you see is what you get, basically. If we just want to boil down the 360 degree design ideal to something, the, it's the dream that in, when you're in the LARP, you can only see things that are inside the fiction. You can only experience things that are inside the fiction. There's a reason that we call this the 360 degree illusion. Um, there are a number of reasons. One is that it generates an illusion of reality, of course. That's the sort of the goal that, that when you're inside the fiction, it creates an illusion that that place is completely real. The other is that it, this design ideal in itself is an illusion. You can't reach it. And people have tried for tens of years. And sometimes LARP makers have managed to build or design or frame an entirely perfect physical environment and what they realize then is that actually the players are still the players. I don't magically transform into my character, the train conductor, so and so, just because the physical environment is there. The role playing still has to happen. So it's also an illusion that can distract you from other parts of your game design. When you design a game or design or produce a game with a 360 mentality that is that that the physical environment of the game is very close to the physical environment of the fiction one of the things that happens is that is that it allows for the larp to 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 explore the physical space and actually it's an implicit idea of this design ideal and again you don't have to think this is a good idea a lot of role playing game designers don't think about this at all but if you make larps that are about the physical space. And in, for instance, in Sweden, uh, this is the dominant tradition. This is how LARP is understood generally in Sweden. LARP is something that happens in a physical environment. Now in Finland, where I'm from, role playing and LARP is something that happens inside the minds of the players. And the, the, the physical environment helps that. It's a support for the role playing. And that means that it doesn't have to be perfect. If it's perfect, awesome. 
that's great, but it's not a requirement for the LARP to work. Uh, and in the Swedish mainstream LARP tradition, for instance, the, the idea is that the physical location is very important. And it would be interesting, I think, for you as designers to go in both directions, experiment with this. Which ones do you like, which kinds do you like the best? But if you do have a physical environment, this picture is from, from Capo, it uh, allows the players to interact with the physical environment. You can go explore the prison camp or the train station or the woods or, or whatever, wherever the game takes place. If we all have to imagine it, it becomes really boring role playing when I'm like, oh, look at this steam engine right here, how shiny it is. Like, I'm just interacting with me. Now, then I would much rather go and role play with a human being or with a physical object. But in the 360 degree illusion games, I can actually go and LARP with stuff and go into a room and see what's in this room. Oh, interesting, a locked treasure chest. And then I can LARP with that. And you don't all have to be there at the same time for the game to become interesting for me. But if the game is not at all about the physical environment, if the, if the game has some completely different theme where the physical environment is completely irrelevant, then this might actually become a distraction. Because if you build a whole prison camp, people will want to go and check it out. And if you need them to stay in their camp, as Al Oliver was speaking yesterday about with what the chairs can allow if you pos position them differently, if you want the players to, to stay in one place, maybe don't build something super interesting for them to go and look at some, in some other place, because they will go there if they have the opportunity. 360 degree illusion is both the easiest to make and the hardest to make. If I want to make a game set in reality, for instance, I could design um, a psychological horror game set at Ruta, and we will write it, and then we will all play it here. And all of the, the buildings are part of it, and the burnt out building, and all the brokenness becomes part of the fiction. It's not that, they, that they're running out of money, it's that the ghosts of Ruta are making the, the buildings crumble. Then the physical environment become a very important part uh, of the fiction, and I don't have to build it because it's already here. So it's the easiest thing to make here. It's very difficult to make an urban action game at Ruta. But on the other hand, it's also the hardest. If you want your LARP to be in a spaceship, it's very difficult to get a real spaceship of that kind because they haven't been invented yet. So then you have to build the whole environment. So it's the most work. And no matter what you aim for, if you aim for the perfect illusion, it will not always happen. This is from a Danish fantasy LARP called Krigslide that has a relatively high standard of costuming and, and props and so on. And the previous picture we saw, I think, was also... No, that is also from there. People look very awesome in these games. And the forest represents the forest and so on. But here you can see the orc... Oh, no, I pressed the... There we are. Um, you can see the orc here on the left, there's a rubber band attached, you know, running across his face. He's painted over it with green. But I think if you interact with him, you can tell very clearly that the nose and the ears don't actually belong to his physical body. And that doesn't matter so much in many games. But if everything else is perfect, then you're going to be looking at that rubber band, like, obsessively. And it will be very difficult to roleplay with this person, because that's the only thing you can think about. Okay, the other end of the fader uh, is symbolism. And that's actually a difficult word, um, but, but what it means is that everything is symbolic, everything has to be translated. This particular game uh, is from uh, um, a, a sort of mini LARP or convention scenario called All for One and Metal for Me. It's about the reunion of, a, of an 80s metal band, and it's played in a classroom at a convention. These guys are the very dangerous metal musicians. <laughs> Yeah. They're not wearing costumes, as you see, one of them is wearing a tie, and it doesn't really matter. Well, one of them here, the guy, and, and the second guy, is, he's wearing shades, and he's at least put the bandana on his head, head, so he's made a little gesture to look like his character. They really only have one pro prop there, which is the prop of their, of their album, the band is called Mantastic. So what's happening in this scene is that they are sitting uh, in America at a mall, trying to sign their album, and nobody cares, nobody is coming. Uh, and this is all about the human interaction. But of course, it's really easy to go to an American mall and have a record signing if you use the symbolism mode of representing the scenography. Um, this picture is from Halatisar, and I've already shown it. But I'm say I think at Halatisar, the physical environment represented pretty close to what it was meant to look like inside the fiction. But what if this game 
what if we would agree that this picture is actually from, from another run of Capo? That hasn't happened, but let's pretend that this game is from Capo and that they're playing Capo in this sort of classroom environment. That would also be a valid way of, of designing a game about the prison camp, but it would restrict some of the kinds of action that could happen in the game. It would focus very much on what's happening between the players and not so much on the flooded floor, because the floor I mean, you could say that in the fiction the floor is flooded and our feet are wet, but it's difficult to maintain focus on how wet your feet are <laughs> for a long time when they're actually dry. So in, the, in these sort of symbolic environments, uh, the, the, the role-playing action, like what the players are actually doing, tends, it focuses it automatically on human interaction. And if that's what you're most interested in, that's actually a, a good thing. Um, and symbolism is also the least physical effort, like, because you don't have to <laughs> build something massive, or if you want to make a game that's about a specific thing in reality, you can also use something in reality, like we could say this, is, this game is going to be set at Ruta in the, in the 1960s, and then we have to go around and take out everything at Ruta that is more modern, if we want to make a 360 degree game, uh, that would be very much hard work. Uh, if we say, well, we're making a LARP that's, LARP that's set at root and it's in the 1960s, but we're playing it in this style, so it doesn't matter that there are some modern cars and our clothes are modern and so, so on. Well, then we don't have to spend all that time going around carrying things around. But you know what? It always takes forever to design a LARP. If you save some time here, you're going to have to spend so much more time on the character writing, on the world description, or, or something else somewhere else. So I just want to remind you that if you think that something is easy when you're designing a LARP, you're making an easy decision somewhere, you're not actually saving time. You're just investing that time somewhere else. It's always going to take 100% of the available time. That is how long it takes to make a LARP. Um, OK. Um, I don't understand what times I'm seeing. Where are we on time? Keep talking. Okay, that's, I don't even know how to read that information, so I'm just going to keep talking until he stops me. Okay, good. Um, uh, just let's just do an example, costumes. Uh, I want to remind you about all of these faders, that it's different, they operate differently depending on what in your LARP you're looking at. So you can look at the whole LARP and say, where are we on the scenography fader? Is it very close to illusion or is it very sort of symbolic, everything? Or you can zoom in on particular things and then they might actually look a little differently. So maybe we're in a very realistic environment, but we are all playing it in our ordinary clothes. And then it ends up sort of average. Another way of it ending up average would be, by the way, the black box where you have an empty environment with very few distractions, but you, on the other hand, don't have so many of the, of the objects uh, that are present inside the fiction. So it, it, you end up kind of in, in the middle. Um, but if, let's look at, zoom in on the costumes of our LARPs that we've played here, uh, or talked about here. On the symbolic level first, the intro game, do you remember when, we were playing, uh, when you were playing students at a middle school dance in the 80s? Um, the cards that represented the memories that the, the characters knew each other, the name tags that were the cards, were of course very symbolic. Uh, because of course in reality, at the dance where everybody goes to school together, they don't wear name tags. And the clothes that we wore were the clothes that we wore. And now you may have felt while you were playing that that's okay. Like maybe the people in the 80s were wearing clothes that looked a little bit like this. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Not so much actually, because I'm old enough to remember you look much better than we did <laughs> in the 80s. So it was very symbolic. It doesn't matter for the design of the game at all. So it was a good design decision. Then in Snaphane, uh, I think we're somewhere in the middle. The characters of Snaphane were probably wearing some clothes that are pretty close to what you are wearing uh, in here for real. Maybe not if you played a very old character and you're walking around in like, a, let's say a short skirt and a midriff bearing top. That's uncommon that 80-year-olds wear that, that, but it's not impossible. But, but it doesn't really matter for that game. But approximately similar clothes, right? So we're getting close to a realistic style of, of costuming in that LARP. Then the soldier comes in, and nobody, no, and Pat, Peter was not wearing a uniform, but he was wearing a blue shirt that kind of nods a little bit. It's a little bit formal. It's a sort of subconscious nod in the direction of a uniform. And somebody actually said uh, when Oliver was playing, and he also wore a blue shirt, that it felt like a uniform. Okay? 
but it's still not the realistic uniform, of course, but it had the effect, it, it communicated what it needed to communicate in the game. And Melan Himmelohav, uh, that Emma was talking about between heaven and sea, uh, where the costumes also, for instance, communicated the gender of the character in that, in that game, even the underwear that we wore was appropriate for the fiction. <laughs> but the scenography overall, that was not a 360 degree LARP. Some of the things were symbolic, like the biodome around the, heav the cupola around us was made out of fabric, which wouldn't actually work in space. Uh, and, and some other things were, but the clothes were very realistic and some of the props were only symbolic and that works fine. Um, yeah, so let's look at the fader maximum and the fader minimum again for this, uh, for this uh, fader. I'd like to remind you that, for instance, a prop or the costume can be part of a game mechanic as well. They can serve many functions. And that's irrelevant of this. So you can play new voices in art in a 360 degree style and you can use the champagne glass uh, meta technique. Or you can use it in a, play it in a completely symbolic style, like perhaps we did here. Uh, and we look just like we look, which is not very much like a gallery opening at all, but at the same time you can still use uh, the champagne glass meta technique. So that's separate from this. And many games can be played at either end of the game, and afterwards you can think about what would happen uh, if, for instance, you play When Our Destinies Meet in a 360 degree environment, or as we have in a completely um, symbolic environment. Okay. The benefits of having a 360 degree illusion game uh, is that the visual world, the world of the game, especially what you see, maybe also what you feel and hear and so on, is coherent. It's, it makes sense internally, so you don't have to spend a lot of mental energy sort of translating things. All of the stuff that's in the world is playable. So I can go and interact with everything that is present in the LARP. If I'm arguing with my husband and I'm working, walking around the room, I can lift things and, or order things, for instance, and they're all present in the fiction. I'm not stepping out of the game to be able to do something physical with my character. There's no risk of translating information differently. And that's actually the real challenge uh, in the other, end of the uh, the other end of the scale. I'll talk about it uh, in a little while. If we say, look at this beautiful steam engine, then we can talk about it in great detail because we all see it and we can talk about what we see. There's a risk otherwise that we're going to talk about that medieval elephant, you know, and that can lead to, to some confusing situations in LARPs. Um, it encourages a non-verbal playing style. You can have totally verbal games in 360 degree mm -hmm. environments. Good, didn't do it again. But it allows for a very physical style where you can carry things and peel things and fight with things and carve things and boil things and sit by the fire and point at things and that works very well in that environment. Uh, also it makes you as a game designer feel important. So if you have a very successful 360 degree illusion it will impress your players and that will make you feel good. Um, and if you, have, if you use what I call real world 360, that you take a part of the real world like Ruta and you draw sort of a circle around it and say this is where we are, this is, this is the fiction now. One interesting effect of that is that you become super aware of everything in the real world. Maybe like in my life when I walk down the street, I'm not paying so much attention, but if I'm suddenly inside a fiction, I'm somebody else, I'm maybe a secret agent and I walk down the same street that I walk down uh, to work every day, I will start to notice things a lot. So when you make games in urban environments, one thing that happens often is that people start to notice things and they think, oh, it was so cool when you had painted that graffiti on the wall that fit the fiction of the universe. No, you hadn't. It's always been there. And it had nothing to do with the game, but they read it into the game. Uh, the downside is that perhaps you start to behave, the players behave more like they do in the real world if they are acting in the real world environment. And of course, this can be enormously expensive and difficult. The middle is the most common, it's a mix of, of these things. If you start, and it's in many ways the easiest, especially if you have an empty room that you can turn into some kind of black box environment, you have an empty room and there are no distractions, and then you only put in the things that you need. Or if you start with the world, again, some of those things may not fit into the fiction and maybe you just pick out those things and you say everything else is okay, and that's again the easiest. It can become distracting for certain types of games. Um, but often this is what you end up doing anyway, because you don't have any resources to do anything else. And that's fine. 
Um, and then the other end is, again, when we are imagining everything in the LARP is happening inside our heads. Um, it's good. It requires folk, people to focus, to share, to imagine actively together and to check in with each other as they are playing all the time. What are you seeing here? We don't say, what are you seeing here? Can you, what does your elephant look like? But what does your elephant look like becomes kind of the, the point of the game. We become very active in our interaction and our mutual focused role playing. Um, and this makes it easy to direct our, the player's attention on the topics that matter for that game as well. Uh, especially if you also have an active game mastering style at the same time. It encourages verbal interaction because it's, there's nothing physical there to interact with or the physical things are wrong for the fiction. And it requires you to carry less heavy things around, so that's good. And also you don't maybe have to have a truck full of props. Like you have to work less physically and for some people it's better. They want to write more and carry less. And that's, then this is a good game design style for you. But it is hard to sustain with large player groups. You know, we already you have played some games with four players and you have played some, some games with all of you. And it becomes difficult to follow the fiction when everything is happening in people's heads, when everybody is playing at the same time. So there are some limits to how large a LARP can actually be player-wise when you have used this scenography. Um, and it's very hard to do nuanced information in any other way than with words. So these are the this is the last slide. These are the questions that you should ask yourself when you're interacting with this slide, which is first, What's the minimum viable scenography that makes my game playable? Like, what has to be there to be able to play this game at all? Um, that's the first question. And when you when you're sorted that out, then actually you can either leave that there and go design the rest of the game, or you can come back and look at the follow-up questions, which are, what kinds of interactions between the player and the environment could make this game work better, for instance? Is part of the fiction taking day at night and part at day? Then maybe it would be useful to have darkness, for instance. What kind of representations of the world would best support my theme and my vision and the kind of playing style that I want my players to have? And finally, what can I afford and what can my players afford? Because if you make a game where they have to make a huge effort with their costume, for instance, to be able to play the game, a lot of players won't be able to come because they don't have time to do that or they don't have the money to buy the things you're asking them to do. And quite often, you know, that's maybe the most important limitation. It's nice to have a huge giant vision, but it's much nicer to have, to have players come to your game. So set your design uh, levels realistically and make the game interesting within the parameters that are possible for your game. Thank you.